NLT. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter blurted out, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud came over them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son, who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground. Then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked, they saw only Jesus. As they went back down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. May God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. Wow. Thanks, Tara. Were you ready for that? All right. Maybe you should come and do it again. Come on. We, we preach. I have to choose between preaching from the New Testament and Old Testament each Sunday. And, and in this passage... Eliza and Moses and Jesus are all in the same one. And the voice of God. And the disciples being terrified. Uh, weren't you excited about that scripture? I'm sorry, I didn't warn you that it was coming so that you'd be a little more excited. However, as I prepared and thought about what this passage, this story, this amazing story, I thought all the Baptist people know about Christmas and they can kind of put that into perspective, right? Right? the coming of Jesus in the, as a baby. And they can kind of do the, the crucifixion and, the, and the, the resurrection. That's Easter, right? And then the ascension. We know that that's when he goes back to heaven. But what about this one? Do you know what it's called? Do you know what the story is called? It's, almost, it's got almost all the same letters as all the other things I just said. Except it says the transfiguration. See, right there. However, so I was thinking, probably they'll hear the scripture... And they'll say, oh, that was the scripture. And I thought, well, I need more than that. We need to deal with this more than that. And it happens that um, a, a lady who, her name's right there, if you look at it, Carolyn Arendt. She's a, a wonderful musician, lives in Surrey, B.C., and she's a mother of two, and she's a songwriter and an author, and she's got books. But I think she thought she needed to go back to school, so she went to Regent College, and her professor this, right now, like in April, they finished in April, is the man who translated the Message Bible, Eugene Peterson. And he said, you can imagine what kind of imagination he has, because if you read the message, you know that. But he said to the, his class, rewrite a Bible story. That's it. Retell a Bible story with your imagination a bit. And she did what we're about to, to share this morning. She retold the transfiguration. In, this, in her writing of it, she uses several words that maybe aren't so common to you, and it, it will help you understand as our friends read the parts. It's Shekinah means divine presence, and that's used in, in one of the readings, and, and so is, and all three of the readings use this word chronos and kairos, and they mean, well, you can see it there, man's time or God's time. So, I don't want you to close your eyes because we're going to have the words on, up on the screen, but kind of calm yourself to let, turn your imagination on too because, well, let's hear the transfiguration retold. Jesus said something about meeting on mountains again and all three of us laughed. I have to admit, covering that post to terra firma, spelling and smelling those uh, old earth smells on the current of a dusty wind, Sinai came rushing back to me. I could almost hear that ancient trumpet. I could almost taste that oddly fragrant smoke. For a moment I felt the old tingle in my nerve endings, the knot in my stomach. Even now my muscles seem to store in their memories the sensation of turning to jelly in the midst of that presence. Jesus was grinning at me. 
so strange to see him contained in his skin, whiskers, and just a little wizened from 30 years of study. He turned to gaze out over the valley. How does the promised land look? He asked. I thought about all the old yearnings, the way I had strained towards the promises, the longing for plenty, for peace, for home. I turned to look straight into his eyes. You look great. He chuckled. He was starting to flicker, just like a burning bush, then bursting out brighter, closer and closer to the way he looks now on the throne. Elijah was squinting at him, mesmerized as always. Jesus was the promised land, all right, but another nickname, nickname was coming to mind now. Shekinah, I whispered. It's almost time. I know, he said, one last exodus. I told him he was not alone and that soon it would be finished. Things he already knew, of course. I started to tell him how glad I was that he had fulfilled the law. He laughed again. You and the law, he said. And then, touching my arm, whispered, you did good, you know. I felt his love move through me like milk and honey, the way it always does. And I, beg I began to say in Kronos, what we live to sing in Kairos, thank you, I love you, holy. Jesus said again about meeting on the mountains again, and all three of us laughed. I don't know if he was thinking of Horeb or of Carmel. They were both hovering in my mind's eye like images. The sound of Jesus' voice always put me back in the cave. Of course, remembering the shock of finding in the whisper what was absent in the earthquake. But a recent rain had left the Tabor trees heavy and damp. So how could I not always also think of water-soaked Carmel, of that instant when the first log sparked and crackled, and I almost fainted with relief. Jesus was talking to Moses. I was staring. It was so strange to see him earthbound, dust on his sandals, blisters on his toes. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him, I murmured. Jesus turned and put his hand on my shoulder. That Isaiah, he grinned, is quite the prophet. Even as he chuckled, he was starting to radiate, heat pouring off him like wood on the altar more and more like his usual self. Moses was doing what he could do to minister to him, the way the father requested. But what can the servants give to the king? I cleared my throat. Soon, I began, the world will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. He reached out his hand again, steadying me as I hung vibrating in that odd twilight between earth and heaven. Yes, Elijah, he said. Yes, they will. I felt his love move through me like a mountain breeze, the way it always does. And I began to say, Kronos, what we live and sing in chaos. Thank you. I love you wholly. Jesus said something about meeting on the mountains again, and all three of us laughed. I thought I was dreaming, of course, wouldn't you? But I willed myself awake and gave my head a shake. I didn't dare get up. I shielded my hand with my, uh, my, uh, my eyes with my hand and made out three figures, Jesus and two others. I can't even tell you how I knew it was them. Moses, for heaven's sakes, and Elijah. I just knew it in my gut instantly, the way I knew whenever the winds were right where to find the fish, or the way my wife seemed to sense it every time there was a new little life in her belly, or the way only a few days earlier I had finally known in a flash who Jesus really was. They were talking, teasing each other. It seemed in the warm, relaxed way of old friends. And then they were looking out over the valley, confiding in a low, 
and serious tone, bent over the world like doctors conferring over a patient. After a while, I didn't recognize the language anymore. All vowels and air, more music than speech. Jesus started to glow. You know when the sun hits the surface of the lake so bright, so hard, you feel like your eyes will catch fire? That's how it started. After a while, it was too much. I had to look away. I could see James and John doubled over, shaking, cowering, like me. Out of the corner of my watering eye, I saw Moses start to float up. Elijah, too. I couldn't stand it. I panicked. I'm not proud of it. I started babbling, something about tents and keeping them there. I wanted to do something. I wanted the world to see what I saw, to know what I knew. James was giving me that, oh, Peter, look. They left, of course, but I didn't have time to mourn because a cloud settled in and there was a voice, the voice. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. That's a direct quote. Eventually, the cloud lifted and the glow slowly faded until Jesus was Jesus again. I left. I felt cold. When I shivered, he came over and put his arm across my shoulder. I felt his love move through me like a beach fire, the way it always does. And for once, I couldn't think of a single thing to say. It's different now. Now I sing in Kairos what I struggled to say in Kronos. Thank you. I love you. Holy. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, it's indeed a gift that you give us the ability to imagine. And it's even more wonderful when you're in control of even our imagination. Lord, we've been helped a little bit this morning with our imagination of what, what was happening that night, that day. But your word is so wonderful that we have the stories of Jesus on earth, talking and walking, teaching. Lord, as we look into this story now, open our hearts so that we can see you in a fresh way. Thanks, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. This isn't a new thought. In fact, I say it almost every week, I think, that how exciting it is that we worship a God whose desire it is that we know him better and better and better. He's a God who reveals not a God who keeps secrets. And each story that we share together has that in it. And we need to, when you read your Bible, when you open up Old Testament, New Testament, if you pray to that, to God and say, Lord, show me what you want me to see of you today in your word. Huh. You know what? I think that it won't be, you won't be able to resist getting back to, get, to do some more of that. The Bible will come alive. But what a wonderful story that we have here. I figured that um, to, to get us in the right mood for this story, I should have got the theme music for the Twilight Zone. And some of you are too young to know what that wonderful television, I think it was even in black and white in the 60s. It was a, a, I looked it up, because we can do that now, you know. And I actually thought I could put the soundtrack back there and and I could, and we'd all get scared and stuff. That's not the shark. It's, it's a different thing. But Rod Taylor, in, in, there's only about three seconds of the music before the voice comes on and says, and it's too scary. And, and, but this is really weird, this story. And, I, and it's okay, I think, that we understand that there are stories in the Bible that we can scratch our heads and say, what? I don't think so. What, what was that about? And this is one of them. There's lots of questions that come to mind when we read a story like this. But there's also a lot of questions in, 
in every story in that we, one of the recurring things that we're trying to deal with is that relationship between what we can see and touch and what we can't see and touch. We call that the difference between physical and spiritual, I guess. And it's an it's a ongoing thing. We have, in our society, we have lots of people that uh, write lots of novels and movies and stuff, uh, and playing with this idea that we really don't know, so you can do whatever you want. We believe that when we accept Jesus into our hearts, the Bible teaches that we are spiritually reborn. So not, we're not just physical beings anymore, but we're spiritual ones that can live forever. Now do I need the music again? Da, na, 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 na. That's kind of weird, living forever. But what if the events in Jesus' life, he, he went around with the disciples and he told stories. What if he decided to give a really good illustration on this very thing so the disciples could get it right? And I think that's a little bit of what we have in why this event happened. And I'm not sure that I can even get there in terms of understanding all the things that this story is. I, I wonder how much it affected Peter, James, and John to be able to witness Jesus in the form of his eternity. I wonder how it affected them. Well, if you think about what happened after the resurrection and ascension and preaching and the Pentecost and all that, those three disciples all of a sudden got bold. They weren't just fishermen anymore. They went around and preached and were so sure of who Jesus was that right till their physical death. So it affected them. And for us, in the few minutes that we have this morning, we've heard the story, we've heard it retold, and we've thought about it, and it points to an incredible truth that Jesus is the Son of God. And as we look at this, the question that needs to be answered in our hearts and our minds is, who's the Jesus that we worship? And what kind of effect does it have on us when we realize who he really is. Does it make us bold? Does it make us live our lives different? So, think about that. What a privilege it is to know more about God and that in this story, we had the voice of God with a message to Peter, James, and John and to us. This is my son. Listen to him. God giving instructions. We had that happen, well, Moses was there when he got the Ten Commandments, some instructions, but how clear can it be to get this instruction? Wow. An incredible story. How are we going to react? Well, it seems that Peter had reacted. The passage starts after six days. And I didn't read that passage, what happened six days before, but what it was, I can tell you really quick. Six days before this happened, they were all sitting around, it seems, the disciples and Jesus, and Jesus said, who does everybody say I am? What's going on? What's the, the word on the street about who I am? He wasn't curious about his popularity. He wanted to know what Peter thought, how far the disciples had come in their understanding of all this. And, Jesus, and Peter blurted out, you're the son of God. Wow, he would got the right answer for once. However, or he said he was the Messiah and, and stuff, but maybe Jesus thought that Peter got the right words, but maybe not clear understanding yet. Because Peter's idea of the Messiah, as we know, there's still lots of confusion in their disciples' minds, how could they know what it really meant? They were taught year after year and they're growing up in their centuries of their history who the Messiah would be. And it was clear, but not when you hear the stories and you have your own set of desires and your own agenda. You can take whatever information you want and you make it fit your agenda. And that happens in our lives too, and I'm not going to go there, but the Peter and the disciples and the Jews were 
crushed by Rome. That was the present problem. They had soldiers in the street who were taking their money and making their mis life miserable. They couldn't make decisions. The Romans did it. And their own priests were tyranny, uh, tyrants too. And so the Messiah bringing them their exodus that they needed in their mind would be like the one getting out of Egypt. So they don't have to be slaves anymore. So their idea of a, a Messiah was a little bit political and a little bit, well, mistaken. So maybe Jesus was, said it was time for Peter to get this right. So he takes Peter, James, and John up the mountain. God had given Peter an incredible awareness already. But he missed the point. It seems that in the story, we get to see that Peter couldn't keep his mouth shut. And that seemed to be what Peter was about, lots. And probably over... If we had some Peter fans here, they'd say I was overstating it against him or anything, but I don't mean to do that, but it seems that Peter was trying to take control. It wasn't just a babbling, oh, I want to do something. You know, I think that maybe Peter wanted to control things. In that scene where Jesus says, who do you say, the people say I am, is the same one where Peter says, no, you can't go to Jerusalem to die. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus said, called Peter Satan, in the sense of, don't tempt me, don't talk to me that way. So Peter's agenda was, I don't want a Messiah who suffers and dies. I want a king that conquers these Romans. So Peter did need correcting. He had missed the point. He was trying to control the situation. Now, you wonder why he would... Well. This is maybe the answer why he would say, let's build some houses for, for you three. Let's, not, let's hang on to this moment. This is really neat. I'm, we're in the presence of something so amazing. Nobody ever believe it. And so let's stay here for a while and not go to Jerusalem. This is, I like the Jesus up here uh, shining, right? But there's no response from, uh, or direct response like from Jesus saying, Peter, Give your head a shake. Houses? Buildings? No, he, we don't get to hear that. It's kind of this kind of there. Peter tries it out, though. Peter wanted to shape Jesus to match his imagination, his desire. My challenge for you this morning would be to actually examine who the Jesus is that you worship. How do you shape Jesus into fitting your pattern, what you need? It happens. We're guilty of that. Taking the words of Jesus that certainly zap our relatives who we don't like. You know, we wouldn't do that, but maybe. It's easy to do this, folks. So the challenge is, who's the real Jesus? Or what is our reaction when we learn more about Jesus? When we read his stories again and again and we get to feel his compassion and his love. And we, when he says, go and do it. We say, well, go and do what? The things Jesus said. Love one another. Forgive. Huh. Does that really apply to me or is that just an option? Well... I believe that when God speaks and says, listen to him, there's not much option. Our obvious response is that we have to listen to what Jesus says. This story, along among many other things, brings up, I would say confusion, because I, I, we're not... I don't know, uh, when you're feeling like you're going to not make it a few more days or something, and you, you're thinking about, well, I can go to heaven, I, I'm saved, and then you think, ah, oh, but those streets paved with gold, they're going to hurt my feet too. I mean, we don't really know what heaven's going to be like, do we? And I'm wondering if it's okay to look, read this story 
and get a few glimpses of heaven. Many of Jesus' miracles were to help the disciples in their misunderstanding of what heaven was like. He kept saying, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he goes and talks about it. And they're usually stories that are upside down from our logic. But I wonder if that helps very often. In our understanding of heaven, understanding of God's plan for us, we can say the words that he is the son of God, he is the Messiah, he is the Savior, he's the Redeemer. But what does that mean to us? God's love offers us eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whosoever believes on him will not perish, but have eternal life. And we go, oh, great. Eternal this life? You know, some people didn't have a good week last week. Not too many of you have identified that to me, and that's, I'm glad. <laughs> but I'm sure that there's some people that had some miserable weeks, and if they were told about that you're going to have eternal life, it's going to be eternal just like last week, uh, I'm not sure that, that you're going to get a, a round of applause on that one. What kind of eternal life is he talking about? And this, little, this story gives us a glimpse. And I don't know that these are conclusions, but the story makes it very clear, and we don't know why, and our little... Uh, drama drew that out a little bit. That P How could Peter know who these people were? I don't know. But Jesus reported to them probably in terms of what the conversation might have been or something so that Matthew had the words to write down. All the gospel writers had words to tell us about that it was Elijah and it was Moses. And we go, okay, they died. Didn't they? Yeah. Their physical bodies died, but here they are, still alive. So we can say, okay. And they were recognizable. I've been asked this by my little daughter. I've been asked by other people about what, can people recognize each other in heaven? And, and if you've got particular people you really don't like and they're going to get to heaven and you recognize them, how can that be heaven? You know, the hard questions, eh? <laughs> yeah, but it seems like it, it's recognizable. And I don't want to draw a list and say this is exactly the way heaven's going to be, but why not? There's just some hints here of what heaven could be like. And they were talking. They weren't playing their harps and singing to each other. Floating on clouds. Well, they were kind of floating. That's really weird too, eh? Between heaven and earth. And they had something to say to the Son of God. And the Son of God had something to say to them. We don't know the real details. Our author friend kind of speculated what was going on in her imagination. But they were talking. There was a relationship that is eternal. And it seems that they had a sense of time, of earthly time. I don't know how that works. Lots of questions. But the most important part is that we are given glimpses of what Jesus, what God is talking about when he says, you will have eternal life. The disciples needed to know more. And I, and I, and I for, forgive me for bringing some of those things up about whether they could talk or whether they could be seen or unrecognized, all that kind of stuff. I don't know. Because even... This much knowledge about the afterlife could be dangerous. In fact, Jesus knew that. The last verse of our scripture reading this morning. He said, by the way, folks, fellas, don't tell anybody what just happened until after I'm raised from the dead. Okay, we know what kind of brains the disciples had. They didn't even want to go to Jerusalem and deal with this. So whether they understood that they, or whether they kept their mouth shut, but the idea is for us is that these kinds of things, knowledge of God's plan for us for eternity, without the context of Jesus defeating death, without the context of the resurrection, it's absolutely dangerous and it's 
open to all kinds of misunderstandings. Jesus warned them, don't tell anybody. In Luke 9.34, it's the same story, and this is a different version. It goes like this. While he was babbling on like this, meaning Peter, while Peter was babbling on like this, a light radiant cloud enveloped them. As they found themselves buried in the cloud, they became deeply aware of God. As they found themselves buried in the cloud, they found themselves deeply aware of God. And I think for us this morning, thinking of what we want to take away from this story, we need to recognize that many times in the deepest awareness of God for us comes in the clouds. When we can't see what's going to happen next. We don't know. In fact, if you've been in a cloud, it's either too bright or too dark. Too hot or too cold. Clouds being in them isn't fun. Looking at them up there and saying, oh, that's pretty cloud, that's nice. When you're in the clouds, and, and we can do this metaphorically too, when your life is obscure, you don't know what's going to happen. It's oppressive, either too hot or too cold. Don't you know it? That's when you feel the presence of God the most. If you have God in your life, if you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, in those moments, his, you'll be so aware of his presence. So, what a wonderful story. What a wonderful idea. And I haven't even touched on, there's tons of books written on the theologies and ideas of what this is supposed to mean and how it fits in and all that. Well, we don't have time for that, but I, we do have, we need each one of us to hear God's voice in this cloud. This is my son, and I'm pleased with what he's doing. Listen to him. Who's the Jesus that you worship? How are you listening to him? If there's a bunch of blanks there about, well, I haven't really heard much this week, or whatever goes on in your brain right now, Folks, fill it in and say, I'm going to do that this week. I'm going to find ways to listen to Jesus. And it doesn't happen if you're busy running around in the cloud. It doesn't happen if you're busy with your agenda and your life. You need to plan times to be quiet, to listen to Jesus. And if you don't want any interference and you want some guidance, make sure your Bible's open to the words of Jesus. And then you'll be obedient to the very voice of God. This is my son. Listen to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a challenge that it is when you give us more information. We're, challenged, we're, we're, we're confused, Lord. We don't understand, and we, but we, we trust that when we need to know more about heaven, you'll tell us. When we need, well, you have told us what we need now. We need to listen to your Son. So, Heavenly Father, give us ways this week, this very day, to be obedient to you by listening to what your Son has to say about everything in our lives. Challenge us, Lord. Give us opportunities. Give us openings in our agenda to actually have time for you with your word open. Help us in this, Heavenly Father. Thank you for this wonderful story, the glimpse of the glory that awaits us. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen.